Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy. This is number two in what I'm teaching on the Evangelism Net. We're going to talk today, how were people saved in the Old Testament? We're going to find out it's by simple faith just like us. He's always been the Redeemer. He's always been the Savior. And evangelism has always been the means of preaching the gospel. It should be increasing in our life today. Let's go to the Word of God and find out just how to do that. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello, I'm Pastor Bob Yandian. I welcome you back to Student of the Word. Glad to have you with us today. I began yesterday, and I'm going to finish it today, a two-parter on the evangelism net. And this is taken from Matthew chapter 13, seven parables that Jesus gave to his disciples about the end times. Now, I want you to notice something about the end times. The end times are going to be the greatest time of evangelism the world has ever seen. I'm talking about the coming tribulation and the ending of the time period we're here called the church, the increase of wit witnessing and then on into the tribulation. The tribulation itself will be the greatest time of evangelism. And so it keeps on continuing. But the reason why I bring that out is notice this, speaking of end times, although we talk about the nations involved that are going to be at that time, the evil nations, the good nations, those working together, but even the good nations will be under Satan's control. It'll be human good, not divine good. That again, what's going to happen during that time is because there's so much uh, trouble going on during the tribulation, so many types of catastrophes and all this, people are going to be turning to the Lord and evangelism will go into high gear during that time. The thing about evangelism is supposed to be increasing and increasing as go on and on. But sadly, in many things we see today in Christian circles, our emphasis is on everything else. And we mainly want to minister to believers or we want to be great, you know, patriots. And I'm a patriot and I believe in ministering to, to believers. But the greatest reason God left us here was to win souls, turn sinners into saints, turn followers of Satan into followers of God, turn children of Satan into children of God. This is a supernatural thing we're mentioning here and talking about. But it's so important that God actually gave us a power to win souls. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. Notice this, not to be just a better citizen. We should be great citizens, not just to witness more and lay hands on Christians and see things happen in church. That's important. You said you shall receive power to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The reason why God left us here, the number one reason God left us in this earth after we get saved is to win souls. And in Matthew 13, he brings this out in verses 47 through 50. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast in the sea. The net is the gospel and the sea is all the nations of the world. We are sent to the nations of the world and gathered every kind, which when it was full, this will be the end of the tribulation. They drew to shore, sat down and gathered the good into vessels and threw the bad away. By bringing this in in the net, they separate believers from unbelievers called good fish and bad fish. And so just like in other uh, things where the Lord referred to it, there was good seed and bad seed. And uh, this is the children of the kingdom versus the children of Satan's kingdom. It says that they threw the bad away. So it'll be at the end of the age. The end of the age is the tribulation. It's the end of the Jewish age. We are living today at the end of the church age of which Jesus will come back for us. And once we're taken out of the earth, he will again shift back to Israel and the last seven years of the Jewish age will be accomplished. And he goes on to say, the angels will come and divide the wicked from the just. And this occurs at the end of the tribulation and cast them, that's the unbelievers into the furnace of fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, we brought this all out yesterday. And if you want to, to find out more, we're offering at the uh, middle of this broadcast, half time, I call it. And it's on the kingdom parables where you can have a copy of this for yourself and listen to it. All the four parables in a row. This again is the seventh one, ending again with the most important part of why God left us here is winning souls. I'm all for running for office and I support good people. I give money to good candidates. I go work with them. I mean, I'm, I tell people who to vote for and all this, but I come back to this. I don't care how great the person is in the White House or whatever. No one's going to beat Jesus at running this entire planet. And he's going to do that one day. And so we ended yesterday talking about 
that uh, when Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation, it'll be just like the days of Noah, a comparison where the world was covered with evil and there wasn't that many good people. There's gonna be more good people though there. But what happens is, is whenever the flood came, it took the evil people away and left the good ones there. The exact opposite of the rapture. We often read those verses there in Matthew 25 and, and say, oh, look, look, you know what it's saying in those verses of scripture is that Jesus, when he comes back, is going to be, uh, you know, as the days of Noah, and they think that's the rapture. Where the and they'll say, look, the the you know that there'll be two in the field, one will be taken, the other the one that's taken is the unbeliever, the exact opposite of the rapture, because when Jesus comes back, this net that's been brought brought in, and the angels that are helping and assisting at that time will be separating the good from the bad, the good fish and the bad fish, the believers from the unbelievers, and the unbelievers will be thrown away, and the the believers will be left on the earth. So that's why it says in the days of Noah, this is Matthew twenty four, and verse thirty and thirty. And then verse 37 through 41, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the days of the coming of Son of Man be. And so again, he mentions in that time what's going to be happening. And in Matthew chapter 25, it says in verse 31 through 34, go there with me. And here we find again the importance of angels even coming at that time and helping Jesus to separate believers from unbelievers and then cast the unbelievers away into outer darkness, into hell to eventually wait a thousand years to go into the lake of fire forever and forever. It says in verse 31 of Matthew 25, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels will them, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and before him all nations will be gathered. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. This isn't saying there are righteous nations and unrighteous nations. No, within every nation, he will separate believers from unbelievers, goats unbelievers from sheep believers. And notice in verse 34, then shall the king say to those on his right hand, that is believers, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. World. In verse 41, he says to the unbeliever, then will he say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed you into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So believers and unbelievers at the end of the tribulation are compared to three things, wheat and chaff. Matthew chapter three, verses 11 and 12, chaff looks like wheat, but has no nutrition. Wheat here and chaff is those who imitate the church, imitate the ways of God, and these are religious people. Then call sheep and goats. Sheep and goats can eat together, be together, but they're different from each other. And the goats are compared to unbelievers and the sheep are compared to believers. That's Matthew 25, verse 31 and 32. And then good fish and bad fish. This is what we came back to again, the evangelism net. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47 and verse 48. So in Matthew chapter 13, by the time we come to the end of the parables, all seven, notice what Jesus says to his disciples in verse 51. Jesus said to them, have you understood these things? I like to think of this, they probably went, uh, yeah, 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 well, yeah. No, they didn't. And so again, he's done this before. Uh, in earlier, uh, Mark chapter four, where he gave them the parables, you know, about uh, the Christian way of life. And they went, uh, yeah, 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 sure. Well, notice what he says here. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, every scribe who is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder who brings forth out of his treasures things new and old. This refers to the fact that when we minister to people, we can bring out Old Testament stories, New Testament uh, teachings, and a minister from the pulpit can bring out things old and new. People talking today about getting rid of the Old Testament. Listen, the Old Testament is the examples for the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the Old Testament was getting to us for examples. So instead of using yourself all the time for an example, why don't you use, you know, Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Why don't you talk about a Red Sea? I'm simply here to tell you the problems of the Old Testament dwarf us, eclipse us with our problems. If God could bring them through a Red Sea and drown their enemies behind them and separate an ocean in front of them, I'm sure he could bring you through your financial mess you're in right now. I'm sure if David could stand in front of a, a giant and kill him with a rock, 
I'm sure God can bring you through your troubles. In other words, if God could do that, he can certainly do it for you. And so he says here, the householder brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. Again, things old is the Old Testament and things new is the New Testament, the church age, and all the things that God is simply telling us in these verses of scripture. Now, it simply comes back again to this. What God has called us to do is to win souls. This is the purpose of why we're here. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're to preach it to everyone. God has given us signs and wonders and miracles. I think of the book of Matthew, so strong in the miracles of Jesus Christ. And Jesus even told them that the purpose of miracles was to see people get saved. Why? Because listen, when Jesus went to the cross, he not only died for our sins, but he also died for our sickness. Now, some of you say, no, no, our church preaches against that. Matthew chapter eight. Verses 16 and 17, Jesus quoted Isaiah 53. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And even though Isaiah 53 isn't translated that way in your King James, Jesus went directly and quoted it from the Hebrew. And what he said was not only did he die for our sins, he also died for our sicknesses. But by the end of Isaiah 53, it says he would divide the spoils among us. It simply means that also prosperity, not exceeding, not everybody becoming billionaires and millionaires. It simply means not only taking care of our needs, but giving us extra also came to the work of the cross. But understand this, three works of the cross. Number one, for our righteousness and the forgiving of sins. Number two, for healing. And number three, to bring us finances in this earth for the spreading of the gospel. What I'm simply saying is two are temporary, one is eternal. But God uses the temporary things to help bring people to the eternal. And that's why Jesus went everywhere, laying hands on the sick, praying, believing, casting out devils, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease for a particular reason. And after he did that, it says, and many believed on him. Notice with signs and wonders, it said many believed in him. You'd think everybody would believe it if they saw somebody come back from the dead, but even skeptics occur at that. Just like the preaching of the gospel, some some people say yes and some people say no. At the watching and seeing of supernatural signs and wonders, some people still say yes and some people still say no. And so with finances, why does God give us finances? The purpose of finances is in the Old Testament, he gives us a power to get wealth so his covenant can be established in the earth. Just like signs and wonders help bring people into the eternal thing of God, which is the new birth, so can temporary money be used to send it around the world for the main purpose of winning souls. This is why God has left us here. He told us to go into all the world, but one person can't go into all the world. We can go into our world, and put all of us together, we can go into the entire world. But where I am in my world and you're headed toward your world and it might be a mission field, I can take my finances and give it to you. And those finances can work to help get people born again. Why is the number one reason God left us here is for eternal things. Not so I can sit and look at all my money, not so I can finally get healed and go, wow, now I can really enjoy my life. No, the purpose of healing is to go win souls. When Jesus raised up Peter's mother-in-law who was healed of a fear, it says she stood up and ministered to them. That's the purpose of signs and wonders and miracles. And so you can now get out of that bed and go do the thing God asked you to do, and that is to win souls. I'm simply saying this for this one purpose. It's time for you to wake up and realize God didn't leave you here just to get our nation back. He didn't leave you here just so you could enjoy the Christian life. He left you here not only so you can just not, so you can go to church a lot and see your friends. He gave you the new birth for one reason, so you can go out and you can win souls too. The number one call on your life is to see people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. <sighs> well, with all of that, I'll see you right after the break. Chapter 13 of Matthew is a pivotal chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. In this revealing chapter, Jesus turns his attention away from Israel and toward the Gentiles. He begins to teach in parables about the kingdom of God so that those who truly desire to hear would understand his message. In these seven in-depth topical studies, Pastor Bob Yandian explores and teaches on the parables found in the book of Matthew. Sermon titles include The Mystery Presented, The Sower and the Seed, Why Parables, The Wheat and the Tares, The Mustard Seed and Leaven, The Treasure and the Pearl, and The Evangelism Net. To order Kingdom Parables, go to bobyandian.com. 
Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College, and I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult, but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. Go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on partnership. I wanna thank my, uh, those that are out there, the, my supporters, those who stand with me, those who are my partners in the giving and the, the, the word of God so this gospel can continue on and this teaching continue on. I am a pastor, I teach the word of God, but I also wanna come back to the priorities of the word of God, and that's to help win souls for the kingdom of God. And so I'm the, I'd say my main call is not just winning souls, the main call I've got on my life besides winning souls, which is always number one, the next thing under that is I've been called to help raise up disciples, because that's also part of the Great Commission. Two parts of the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and then also go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them. He said with the gospel, he said, go preach the gospel and whoever believes will be saved, whoever does not believe will be damned. But he also talked about disciples, says go and teach all nations. Preaching is mainly to unbelievers and teaching is mainly to believers. But again, the both are necessary. One gets them into the kingdom and one establishes them in the kingdom so they can go out and win others too. This is what disciples do. I've heard this said before, converts get to go to heaven, but disciples take others with them. And this is why God has called us to do this. Now, the purpose of this is, again comes back to the gospel. I simply wanna qualify this. We preach the gospel, which has never changed. The results have changed of preaching the gospel, but the gospel itself has never changed. It's always been the means of winning souls. You know, there's a verse of scripture in uh, chapter three and chapter four of Hebrews that says this, unto them, was the gospel preached as well as unto us. But the gospel preached unto them did them no good because they did not enter into God's rest. Now here's the point of what God was saying is that the gospel has always been here. And when he said unto them was the gospel preached as well as unto us them, he was referring specifically to the Exodus generation, those who came out of Egypt and headed toward the promised land. And he simply said again, notice this, unto them was the gospel preached. Well, they accepted it in Egypt and they came through the Red Sea. All who went across were believers, but they never became disciples in that first generation. They died as weak believers and their children went on into the promised land after that because they grew up and started accepting the plan of God. And it simply comes back to this. It's always been the gospel. It's always been, that's what's been preached for the winning of souls. Uh, you think about the time when Adam and Eve sinned. What happened right after that? God introduced the killing of an animal. They came to him with fig leaves. That's always man's answer. Man's answer is religion. And they came to him because they were no longer joined to him. They couldn't see clearly. And what they simply did was they went and grabbed the first thing they could do. And for the first time, they noticed they were naked. And when they noticed they were naked, the first thing they went, they went and got some fig leaves wrapped around themselves. Fig trees is, uh, is an example there of man's answers. And man's answers wither away. Fig leaves didn't last long. God went out and became the first one to start with fur coats and killed an animal. Sorry, some of you that are, you know, don't want to kill animals and make fur coats. God did. He was the first one. And he killed an animal, brought the, uh, the skins to them so that they would have something that would last a long, long time. This is a type of religion versus the gospel of Jesus Christ. One will just temporarily cover you, but the other one is eternal. And so this is what happened. God introduced the gospel there. And this is what happened when Cain and Abel came. Cain slew Abel for this reason. Cain brought the, the crops that he grew and Abel came and offered a sacrifice to the Lord. He must have seen what God did. He must have known what God did. Apparently Adam and Eve told the sons what God did. And so where they took and took plants and wrapped around themselves, well, you know, God came and put an animal skin around them. But again, Cain came and offered the best he had, his vegetables and all the things he grew from the ground. 
And then Abel came and he offered a lamb to the Lord or a sacrifice of some kind and God accepted one, said no to the other. But he gave the other one time. It said he gave him time to go and bring the correct one in, but he got jealous and bitter and killed his brother because of it. That's what religion does. Religion is out to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we find there again a substitute. But what he was practicing, Abel was, was bringing blood to the Lord, which represented the coming blood of Jesus Christ. When God slew an animal, it's a type of Jesus Christ, the blood that was slain represents. Throughout the Old Testament, there was the shedding of blood, never to save anyone. The blood of animals cannot save us. Hebrews chapter 10 says it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should ever remove sin. The purpose of the animals dying and the blood was to represent Jesus Christ coming and they could understand the gospel. Why did God give the law? Well, first of all, he didn't want to give the law, but Israel said, give it to us. And Israel turned the law into the means of salvation, which God never intended because the law cannot save. One of the favorite things I do when I sit in front of a, especially in front, uh, in front of a new group of students, I'll be teaching in a Bible school somewhere. This is the first question I ask him. How are people saved in the Old Testament? I get one of two answers. Number one, well, by keeping the law. And the other say, well, well, no, no, by giving animal sacrifices. Bible says in both cases, neither one can save you. It says by the keeping of the law shall no flesh, no flesh, that's Old Testament, new, any flesh at all, no flesh will be saved by the keeping of the law. The second one was by the, by the shedding of blood. It talks about the sacrifices. It said in Hebrews chapter 10, it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should remove sin. So what was it for? It simply was to teach about the one that could sin. The two aspects of witnessing comes to this. If God has called us to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, then there's two aspects. Number one, they have to realize they're a sinner. And number two, they need a savior. That is what witnessing is. Uh, You may tell them you need salvation. The first thing they tell you is they'll start justifying themselves. Well, I think I'm good. I think my good outweighs my bad. And since my good outweighs my bad, God's gonna let me go into heaven because I've been good. No, you cannot be good enough to get it to heaven. This is why Jesus had to come. So the first thing you realize is I can't be good. I'm under a curse. I was born under that curse. I was born under the curse of Adam. And the only way I can have eternal life is I have to die in Adam and be reborn into the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do that yourself. It takes God to do that. And so that comes by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What is it that taught that? The law teaches that. The law simply is God's standard of which you say, I can do that. And the harder they tried, the worse they failed. The harder they tried, the worse they failed. It's the same thing today. People who think they can get into heaven by their own works do not understand the standard that God had. And that's what the law did. The law established a standard for God and a standard for man. And man said, oh, we can do that. And they couldn't do it. Well, then the second one was the sacrifices. What's that for? Since you can't save yourself, there has to be a sacrifice that'll do it. And the sacrifices spoke of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Since you can't save yourself, God provided a means of salvation. So the law says you're a sinner. The, the sacrifices say you need a savior. And every sacrifice spoke of Jesus Christ, every one of them. And that's why the New Testament teaches this. So what am I saying? The law was simply there to help them come back to the truth of the gospel. Or as Paul said it, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The schoolmaster disappears once you come to Christ. After coming to the Christ, you no longer need the schoolmaster. The law did its part. The law cannot save, but it can point to the one who can save. Outside of Tulsa's a little town, uh, not, not too far down the road, Sepulpa. I've driven by and there's signs out there saying Sepulpa so far. But can you imagine running over and grabbing the sign that says Sepulpa and say, I'm in Sepulpa. No, you're not. You're at the sign that points to it. By grabbing the law and embracing it and say, oh, now I'm saved. The law says, no, 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 no. I'm only the sign post pointing you in the right direction. I am here to point you in the right direction. Once you get to Sepulpa, you don't need me anymore. And that's why Paul said that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that after we come to Christ, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Why am I saying that? Because all the word of God has always been this one thing. The plan of salvation has always been by grace through faith. What does he say in chapter four of the book of Romans? Chapter four says, Abraham had faith in the Lord. It was accounted to him for righteousness. 
And Abraham was 430 years before the law ever came. He was justified by faith as everyone before him. Adam and Eve and Abel and Enoch and Noah and all those before him were saved by faith, 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 faith. This is all found in the Heroes of Faith chapter, chapter 11. But also in chapter four of Romans, it says this, and also as David has said, happy is the man whom the Lord imputes not his trespasses against him. David was saved by grace through faith as Abraham was saved by grace through faith. And listen, Abraham was before the law and David was during the law. Salvation was the same before the law. It was the same during the law, although they had more help during the time of the law because the law pointed them in the right direction. But here's the sad thing. People picked up the signpost and they went everywhere preaching the signpost. They started preaching the law. And by the time Jesus came, he pointed them and said, he said, you foul men, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. He said, you go into all the world and you make proselytes of all nations. Proselytes was not what God was looking for. He was looking for converts. So don't go preach the law to the nations. It was given to you, the custodians of the gospel, you, the custodians of the word of God to learn about Jesus. Don't take the law to the nations. Take what the law teaches to the nations. Jesus Christ died for our sins and is the only means of salvation. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, but Israel failed. And by the time that Jesus came, he took it from them. Chapter 22 of, of, of the book of Matthew and tells him, it's gonna be taken from you and given to another nation. It's being taken from you temporarily. For 2000 years, you haven't had it. But as soon as the church is taken out of the way, I'm gonna give it back to you. And the first thing that's gonna happen when the gospel is given back again to the nation of Israel, 144,000 Jews received Jesus. Romans chapter 11 tells us in, in that chapter, verse 25 and verse 26, that uh, during the church age, Israel has partial blindness and can't see. But by the time Jesus comes, the church is removed. That partial blindness will be removed and they will see and they'll start to spread the gospel again. The gospel has always been the means of salvation. Why do I say that? We stand in a long line of people, but on the day of Pentecost, God gave a supernatural assistance to the preaching of the word of God. And that is the Holy Spirit coming upon you that you'll receive power and that once you receive the power, then you're gonna start spreading the gospel with laying on of hands, casting out devils, signs and wonders, even raising the dead, he said, if that's what it takes. And so that's what God has done. We have something they didn't have in the Old Testament. Oh yeah, there was healings in the Old Testament, mainly believers. All right, sometimes an unbeliever might get healed, but very rarely it was always believers in the New Testament. We are to take this to the nations. And long before they ever received Jesus as Savior, we can lay hands on the sick. And the Bible says when Jesus laid hands on the sick and they were healed, the multitudes were healed. It says afterwards, it says many believed on him, which tells us something. He healed them as sinners. But the purpose of it was so they would see the power of God and accept him as Lord and Savior. Matthew chapter nine, when Jesus raised up the man that was on the cot that was paralyzed, he stood up. Jesus said, I've done this so you'll understand one thing. He said, I'm gonna heal this man and the healing of his physical body will be a demonstration of what God can do inside of you. Physical healing is a sign that we can't remove physical sickness. We can, doctors can't even remove it. What doctors can do is assist nature, but a good doctor will tell you, we can't heal anybody. We just find out how the body works and we work with it. So God was simply saying, even this disease, which no man can heal, represent the fact that if I can heal that, then I can surely save you of your sins. And that's why Jesus was telling him on that day, he said, again, I can heal the sick, but I can also bring you eternal life. This is the purpose of the gospel. We have been given supernatural assistance to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch your highest calling, bringing people into the kingdom of God, witnessing to them of the power of Jesus Christ. Have a good day. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.